I, re I remember the moment when I decided to move to Portland, and it was when I walked into Powell's. <laughs> and I remember the last moment, which is that unfortunately I had to move to San Francisco and into an apartment. So uh, we brought in all of, not all of our books, but it was like 20 boxes of books. And so I feel like I'm here in my living room visiting my books. <laughs> um, before I start, I also just want to say how much I appreciate you all being here, um, because I know there are a lot of people who may think they've heard enough about September 11, 2001, by October 19, 2007. Um, but I, I really feel we are just getting around to talking about so much that's happened in America since that day. Um, individual. Americans may have responded courageously and reasonably, but the nation as a whole uh, responded to the attacks in ways that, uh, when we reflect on it, are truly strange and disturbing uh, and, and beg for explanation. Uh, let me give you a, a few examples of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, you, you may remember that uh, politicians and pundits at the time were spouting uh, all this vigilante rhetoric about how we should smoke them out of their holes and shoot them between the eyes. Uh, that, that last came out of uh, uh, one commentator in New York. Uh, John Wayne kept coming up. Uh, there were all, and there were all these references to how the war on terror was like uh, returning to our Indian wars. Uh, the media um, was also claiming that the attacks were going to bring back traditional family arrangements. Now, you may not recall um, some of this because it, it washed over us at the time with very little inspection. Um, but there was this insistence that 9-11 uh, was going to bring on a marriage boom, a baby boom, a, a return to traditional domesticity. Even feminism uh, was said to be deep-sixed by the attacks. I, I actually had a, an early warning of this last one. Um, on the very afternoon of 9-11, I was sitting home like everybody else, uh, you know, numbly watching the towers fall over and over on TV when my phone rang. And it was a reporter doing a reaction story. Uh, mostly, though, he wanted uh, he seemed quite eager to tell me what his reaction was. <laughs> well, he said, this sure pushes feminism off the map. Now, this was all not only baffling, but not how other countries who've suffered terrorist attacks, uh, like England or Spain, uh, responded. It seemed peculiar to us as a nation. Uh, so tonight, I don't want to talk to you about what 9-11 did to Americans. I want to talk to you about what 9-11 revealed about America. Because I came to feel that underlying our reactions was a cultural mythology um, that we have barely begun to reckon with. And it holds a key to a number of mysteries. For instance, why, when the hijackers attacked uh, the symbols of American commercial and military power, um, were we acting as if they had targeted our home and a hearth? Why, when we've been attacked by men who hate Western women's liberation, uh, were some of our pundits uh, so eager to usher in the end of, of feminism? And why, when we've been called on to fight a new kind of war in the global age, uh, were our leaders uh, reaching for their coonskin caps and reenacting some kind of Wild West drama? Why, with all the crises we had to deal with in this period, was there this huge to-do about the rescue of one quote-unquote girl, Private Jessica Lynch? I want to talk to you about all of these aspects, but um, first I want to start with another question. And to answer it, I'm going to take a brief foray into American history. Perhaps the most mysterious of the contradictions was this one. We kept hearing over and over that these attacks were something that had ne never happened to us before. 
America, we kept hearing, is not a place that's vulnerable to assault on home soil. And in recent times, that's true. But if we actually consider America's real history, we realize something very important. This has happened to us before, over and over. And its happening was essential to the formation of the American character. For the first 200 years, the main feature of colonial American life was being attacked on quote unquote home soil. Now, granted, this was home soil that Anglo settlers had taken from the native population. <laughs> Nevertheless, from the settlers' uh, tunnel vision point of view, um, it felt as if they were being attacked by people who they regarded and demonized as non-Christian, non-white, quote unquote, terrorists, a term that was actually employed at the time. These were attacks um, that involved villages, communities, they were aimed at the home and hearth. These were also deeply traumatic attacks for both sides. Uh, King Philip's War, which uh, began in 1675, was the formative confrontation between white settlers and New England tribes. It stands to this day as, per capita, America's deadliest war. In one year, one of every 10 men of military age in the Massachusetts Bay Colony was killed. Uh, two thirds of New England towns uh, were attacked. More than half of them were destroyed. The settlers were forced to retreat nearly to the coast. Um, the economy was in ruins. And the society fell into what came to be known as the Great Crisis. Uh, Indian suffer suffering and casualties, of course, were even it were far worse. The bitterness unleashed on both sides would initiate a harrowing series of conflicts that would drag on well into the 18th century. Those conflicts reduced early settlers to a state of perpetual insecurity, uh, what frontier historian Richard Slotkin called, quote, an atmosphere of terror. Now, how did we as a nation respond in the years to come to this foundational experience of terror? Largely by covering it up with the creation of a cultural myth. Beginning in the 18th century and, and culminating in the Victorian era, our culture, its journalists, politicians, novelists, artists, concocted a fantasy that post-revolutionary America desperately wanted to believe a myth of ourselves as triumphal rescuers, the myth of American invincibility. Now, in talking about this, I am not talking about some sort of recovered memory syndrome. Uh, we didn't remember the original trauma. Uh, given Americans' pension for history, we barely remember what happened yesterday, <laughs> unless it involves Britney Spears. Um, <laughs> What I'm talking about is a tangible cultural heritage, uh, a worldview whose instructions are handed down in everything from newspaper accounts to novels to movie scripts. And furthermore, um, I'm talking about a myth that doesn't belong necessarily to one sex or another. Both men and women buy into it. But thanks to its history, it has a gender aspect. And this is because our early experience of terror was deeply humiliating to the settler community. Time and again, leaders, militias, husbands were not able to protect families in frontier towns, nor to rescue them. Um, between the late 17th and early 18th century, more than a quarter of New England women who were taken captive were never rescued and a whopping 60% of girls were never rescued. Um, male settlers suffered the further mortification of hearing female captives denounce um, male failed efforts, um, or possibly worse, announce how they, the women, had managed to defend themselves without male help. So we had Mary Rowlandson, who wrote the most famous um, account of her captivity, 
uh, who told how she negotiated shrewdly with her captors and named her own ransom um, and had a, a few rather tart words for the militia that was supposed to come rescue them and got within a few yards and then decided they couldn't cross the river even though the whole Indian party she was with, including, um, and, as she put it, women, uh, children, and the lame, um, managed to cross without any trouble. Uh, Hannah Dustin, who was uh, abducted from her home, um, uh, having just given birth to her 12th child, um, was abducted. Uh, as she was being abducted, her husband ran in the door and then promptly ran out again. Um, and she announced how she freed herself by killing uh, 10 Indians and also scalping 10 Indians uh, so that she could get the bounty. Uh, these were the kind of accounts that got rewritten and rewritten until male shame had been turned into an exaggerated ironclad male valor um, and female strength um, was denounced uh, and replaced with an exaggerated helplessness. Um, Hannah Dustin is a, a classic case in point. There were a whole bunch of literary luminaries who went after her in the 19th century. You know, long, this is Nathaniel Hawthorne most famously uh, turned Hannah Dustin's husband. Nathaniel Hawthorne most famously uh, turned Hannah Dustin's husband Thomas uh, into a mighty hero on horseback, um, based on only his own fever imagination. There's no evidence of that, um, and turned Hannah into what Hawthorne called a bloody old hag who should be expunged from the history books. Um, the women who weren't turned into hags were turned into frail creatures um, in danger of rape unless they were rescued. It's in this way that we ended up with uh, Natty Bumpo and Last of the Mohicans, Buffalo Bill, uh, and all those dime store cowboy heroes um, rescuing helpless young women. Uh, all the way down to the modern era of movies, uh, to Birth of a Nation with the uh, in Knight Riders rescuing the uh, virginal, you know, white Southern maidenhood, um, to John Wayne saving little Debbie in the 1956 Western classic The Searchers, uh, to Tom Cruise uh, in uh, saving his daughter from both Martian attack and uh, molester attack. Um, in Spielberg's uh, film War of the Worlds, which was very much informed by 9-11, as those of you who have seen it know. Um, the point is, this is a general myth of, of a national character, um, but because of its origins, it relies on a gender formula. Um, it relies on a formula based on, on male and female roles. Um, the formula goes, the nation is strong because its men are brave and capable protectors, uh, but men can't be shown to be brave and capable unless the women are weak and in need of a male savior. So all that said, let me uh, finally return us to September 11. On that day, you could say that we suffered two attacks a physical attack that destroyed buildings and people, and a symbolic attack that shattered our myth of American invincibility. In response, we deployed um, some rather heavy artillery <coughs> to repair the myth. Now, how did we do this? By using a trumped up domestic drama to paper over our vulnerability. Uh, this expressed itself in a variety of ways, uh, some of which are exceedingly frivolous and silly. Uh, other ways were important and dangerous. So let, let me start with a silly and we'll go from there. Um, look at some of the messages we got after September 11. Uh, by the end of October 11, uh, I counted four articles in the New York Times alone uh, that claimed that the attacks were causing single career women to repent their independence and rush to the wedding altar. Uh, one of these articles actually advised women um, that they should take as their model the Twin Towers. 
which uh, the Times explained uh, were like a Mr. and Mrs. A quote, long married couple caught up in a 30 year romance. Uh, <laughs> exactly, what? <laughs> That's what I said. Um, single women who did not get married, uh, the Times said, would be seen as, quote, out of sync with the country's renewed sense of purpose quote, small-minded and, quote, unpatriotic. Now, you can see this sort of weird line forming all over the media. Uh, newspapers and news weeklies predicted that 9-11 would take a deep mental toll on the unmarried because they'd have no one to call if their plane was hijacked. <laughs> which I'm sure it would be the first thing on your mind if your plane was hijacked. Um, CBS's The Early Show summoned uh, unwed women to the set and asked them to talk about, quote, the void you must now feel. Even uh, the, the tabloid The Star published a special post 9-11 issue with Hollywood celebrities um, berating themselves for failing to commit sufficiently to family life. 9-11 was also supposedly driving women to the nursery. Uh, the press claimed that the attack had set off women's biological clocks, uh, that there would be a big baby boom uh, nine months hence, uh, which by the way never materialized, um, and having babies was now women's, quote, patriotic duty. Uh, women were also said to be responding to 9-11 by returning to homemaking. Uh, the LA Times said that the shock of the attacks was, quote, pushing some of the country's best prepared career women towards stay-at-home motherhood. Time magazine predicted that women would stock up on meatloaf pans and sewing machines. <laughs> Stay home, the magazine said. Sew your own drapes and dresses. TV programmers announced that in 2002, the new shows for the, quote, post 9-11 inspired season uh, would be dramas about, guess what, women returning to the home. And the fashion industry promoted what it called crisis couture, <laughs> uh, which would be all about, they said, chiffon, baby doll dresses, and white lace. This may be one of the reasons why there's still all these baby doll outfits in the, in the stores, as any of you have tried to find a normal shirt, well, <laughs> acknowledge. Um, women, Vogue magazine told us, would now want outfits that were, quote, distinctively non-aggressive and no longer, quote, about dominance and power. Now, there was a tremendous amount of this silliness, but it also had a serious side. Uh, right after the attacks, there were an alarming number of articles and commentaries accusing women, uh, specifically feminists, of weakening our, uh, our military, undermining our resolve to fight, uh, and exhibiting traitorous behavior. You know, I actually, I just clipped from the paper, and you probably all have seen this, it was in Maureen Dowd's column about, um, this is just two days ago, uh, David Horowitz's you know, conservative Freedom Center, uh, urging college students to stage sit-ins outside the offices of women's studies departments to protest, quote, the silence of feminists over the oppression of women in Islam, which um, is kind of astounding when you think um, feminists uh, in America, particularly the feminist majority, were really the only ones speaking up about the Taliban in, um, years before you know, it ever registered on anyone's radar. Um, and after 9-11, many feminist critics uh, were from Kathapala to uh, the novelist uh, Barbara Kingsolver to, of course, you know, Susan Sontag, uh, were vilified um, for raising their voice in even the most um, uh, tempered ways and vilified in extremely ugly fashion. Uh, more generally, women's voices began disappearing from op-ed pages and news uh, uh, talk shows right after 9-11. Um, in the first seven weeks following the attacks, the number of female guests on the Sunday morning news programs shrank by 40 percent. 
even women who are heads of congressional subcommittees dealing with terrorism, like uh, Senators Feinstein and Boxer, uh, made no appearances on these shows. Now, so while women were being shrunk, uh, men were being inflated. Uh, in particular, our male political leaders uh, were being inflated and reimagined as superheroes and power lifters. Uh, the media called Bush uh, approvingly our Lone Ranger, that was on the cover of, I think it was Time, um, Top Gun, Superman, Bullet Man, and America's Dragon Slayer. Newsweek applauded Bush and said we should all feel um, uh, more secure because um, the president is, quote, a fighting machine who has dropped 15 pounds and cut his time in the mile to seven minutes. <laughs> Vanity Fair uh, ran a cover story photo essay describing Bush and um, his cabinet as the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> Uh, and his story assigned these kind of raw knuckled nicknames um, to each of Bush's men. So Cheney became The Rock, uh, Ashcroft was The Heat, uh, and Tom Ridge was The Protector. Uh, the, the magazine actually further lionized Ridge, uh, uh, praising him for his, quote, prominent Buzz Lightyear jaw which the magazine said gave him the right appearance for a director of Homeland Security. Uh, the new post 9-11 American man in general was uh, described as a red meat eater. Uh, a Washington Post article declared that thanks to 9-11 we were quote heading back into a time when real men bring home the bacon and their women cook it up. Rudy Giuliani was described in Newsweek as a man who ate, quote, meats that sweat. <laughs> and when cabinet members gathered right after the attacks at Camp David, um, much was made of the fact that they were dining on what was billed as a, quote, Wild West menu of buffalo meat. Um, all of these stories were uh, characterized by one uh, nationally syndicated columnist this way. So long, sissy boys. Goodbye, sensitive man. After 30 years of wimpifying its men, turning us all into spit shine, dough bald, egg headed, girly boys who can clip a cuticle. <laughs> Manly men are back in vogue. Guys who are not afraid to get their hands dirty and who don't necessarily worry about washing them before eating a liverwurst and onion sandwich. <laughs> and this is the model of manhood women were uh, supposedly swooning to date after 9-11, according to the newspapers. Um, on television, the new manly man wasn't just a hunky firefighter. Uh, increasingly, he was a violent vigilante. Uh, a study by the group Human Rights First found that um, acts of torture on primetime television had gone from fewer than four a year before 9-11 uh, to more than 100. And the torturers, who in the past were almost entirely uh, the villains, were now um, so often the show's heroes. Uh, these were heroes emulated, uh, ultimately, by so many US soldiers in Iraq uh, that the military brass uh, met with the producers of the show 24 uh, to plead with them to stop exalting torture. And then there was the return of the Duke. Uh, there were all these media salutes to the so-called return of John Wayne. We probably, you probably remember the, one of the more famous ones, Peggy Noonan's, uh, where she says, you know, welcome back Duke. You know, uh, for the ashes of 9-11 arise the manly virtues, men who push things and pull things and tell everyone else where to go. Um, the, there were endless uh, reruns of John Wayne movies. Uh, the recording industry even reissued John Wayne's America, Why I Love Her, uh, with the Duke reciting patriotic speeches in the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, some of this, although not all of it, may um, sound you know, odd but relatively harmless. 
If it weren't for the fact that it took over our public life, starting with our presidential politics, look at the 2004 presidential campaign. Uh, the candidates seem to be competing for the title of Davy Crockett in chief, and bragging about their gun collections in the press, uh, hacking at sagebrush and tree stumps. Uh, John Kerry was, you know, out every weekend shooting wild animals and waving the bloody pelts at journalists. Um, when the candidates weren't locking and loading, they were vowing to protect mothers and their children from uh, marauding terrorists in the suburbs. Bush announced that he was guarding us from enemies who would, quote, strike our homes. Uh, and John Kerry said he would fight terrorism because it was, quote, my sacred duty to protect the bond between a mother and child. So here we have all the elements of the myth, the strong, inflated man, the woman uh, cowering back at the homestead. All that's missing is the rescue of the girl, uh, preferably one who is in danger of being violated. And that's where the Jessica Lynch story comes in, a, a story that agitated our culture for months on end. Y you all remember how this story supposedly went, uh, that special ops teams you know, battled their way into an Iraqi hospital after midnight uh, to rescue Lynch from bloodthirsty Fedayeen death squads uh, who, it was insinuated without any evidence, um, may have raped her. In reality, there was no fight. There were no death squads, as the military knew, because they had been informed that the Fedayeen, the last few remaining Fedayeen, who were basically just hiding in the cellar, um, had, had long gone. Uh, it was just a bunch of doctors and nurses uh, trying to take care of Lynch and actually trying to return her to the US military, um, an effort that failed when they got to uh, a checkpoint and the Marines began shooting at the ambulance and they had to return her. Um, but that story of the daring raid and the helpless rescued girl was very important to us as a culture. Um, now, uh, more recently, there was a, a certain amount of debunking of the Jessica Lynch story within the, uh, within the last year over whether she fired her gun or not, whether she was a you know, Rambo or not, which if you go back and look at it, um, that the, the, I, the whole story about her shooting until she ran out of bullets was actually a one-day story that the, the media um, immediately jumped on and attacked. Um, it, it was a story that ran in the Washington Post and then was um, uh, uh, taken back over and over again for months on end. Um, but there's one element that hasn't been focused on, and that's the transformation of a soldier who enlisted not once but twice into a delicate, helpless little maiden. Um, so I thought I'd just read you a, a, just a few paragraphs from my book that describes this, um, how the media sort of remade her. We cast our male soldiers returning from the war zone as battle-tested, seasoned, tougher, old beyond their years. But the post-war Lynch would be lauded not for her hard-won maturity, but for having remained a girl. Her virtue lay in her preserved and aspic innocence. She hasn't changed one bit, a typical media report assured, after consulting with her kindergarten teacher. The celebration of her perpetual childhood began immediately with media accounts from the military hospital in Germany that described her as the tiny girl and the blonde waif. She was said to be clutching a teddy bear. She was said to favor applesauce and steamed carrots. She was said to be dreaming of washing her hair and styling it with a curling iron. She was said to be asking for her mother. Stateside, reporters flocked to Palestine, West Virginia, her, her hometown, uh, to harvest sugar and spice details from kindergarten teachers and grade school playmates. Her grandmother called her precious little Jessie, the media reported. Little Jessie was, according to various dispatches, a, quote, princess laying out her clothes every night, who liked, hair ribbons to, who liked her hair ribbons to match her outfits 
and, quote, a little girl who loved pink dresses and perfect hair. We learned that she once fractured her arm and insisted on a pink cast to go with her pink shoelaces, that she used to play with Barbies, that she presided at the, in the, oh, as the Ward County Fair's Miss Congeniality, uh, that she couldn't hit the ball at all in softball, wore small waisted dresses, and was every mother's dream of a teenage daughter. When the former New York Times reporter Rick Bragg sat down um, some months later to write his account of Lynch called, I am a soldier too, he devoted a chapter titled Princess to the enumeration of her maidenly attributes. The chapter's first sentence is, her bangs were always perfect. The biography of a good girl follows. She was born tiny and beautiful a, quote, doll-like little girl who was almost as quiet as one and never any trouble. In middle school, she was a cheerleader in, quote, little pleated skirts. Even while playing school sports, she was, quote, always perfectly made up. As Miss Congeniality, she was, quote, radiant in her burgundy form-hugging gown. In other words, the princess belonged in beauty pageants, not boot camp. Quote, her fatigue swallowed her like a big frog, Bragg wrote. She looked like a child who had sneaked into her daddy's closet and tried on his uniform to play soldier. <laughs> I Am a Soldier Too seemed an ironic title for a book dedicated to proving the opposite. Now, you could see these rescue fantasies playing out in all kinds of ways, uh, like the famous $17 million ad that uh, featured Bush giving a protective hug to a girl whose mother had died in the World Trade Center. Um, in, in the ad, the, uh, the girl um, is quoted as saying, he's the most powerful man in the world, and all he wants to do is make sure I'm safe. Or take the invention of the mythical security mom, um, who supposedly was desperate for a presidential sheriff to defend her and her children. Or all the rhetoric, empty rhetoric, about how we were going to rescue Afghani women from their burqas. Or we were going to save uh, Iraqi women from Saddam Hussein's uh, quote unquote rape rooms. It would be one thing if we uh, had just invoked these fantasies to get us through a hard time. But our, our leaders use these fantasies as a substitute for crucial action. Look, for example, at how the New York City firefighters were expected uh, to settle for hero worship in the place of working radios, safety equipment, and the economic support they needed and had begged for in order to be effective heroes or the 9-11 widows who got denounced the minute they quit playing the role of helpless homemaker victim and began to push the government for an accounting of the decisions and missteps that led up to 9-11. There are real consequences to acting according to a made-up script, and real people paid them. America as a whole has suffered. Instead of an actual effort to improve national security and hone a working military strategy, we have been fed adolescent fantasies about missions accomplished and amber alerts and evildoers crushed. Living in a myth cleared the way to the erosion of civil liberties and government endorsements of torture. It led us into a misbegotten war against a people who had not attacked us and crippled our fight against those who did. And back home, it closed the door to badly needed introspection and insight. So here we are now, six years out from the attacks. Uh, if the polls on public attitudes toward Bush's performance um, uh, in the Iraq war are any indication, we may finally be ready to ask some hard questions about our response to 9-11. And in that regard, as troubling as all this is, we also live at a moment of possibility. By putting us through a trauma much like the original trauma that produced our national myth, 
The attacks on 9-11 present us with a historic opportunity to revisit that past and reverse that long denial, to resolve the old story in a way that honors the country and its true history, to see ourselves and our frailties in a realistic light instead of papering them over with buckskin bravado and dangerous delusions. I want to thank you very much for listening. You've been watching journalist and author Susan Faludi speaking about her newest book, The Terror Dream, Fear and Fantasy in Post-9-11 America. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer segment from this presentation. Susan Faludi spoke at Powell's City of Books in Portland, Oregon, on October 19, 2007. Her other books include Stiffed, The Betrayal of the American Man, and Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women. To find out more about the author and her work, please visit her website at www.susanfaludi.com. And now we return to Susan Faludi, talking about her latest book, The Terror Dream, Fear and Fantasy in Post-9-11 America. I can take comments, questions, yes. I'm glad that you ended on a hopeful note, because... Because there's not much to feel hopeful about. Right. <laughs> but as I was listening to you, I kept thinking of backlash, and, and it yeah. seems like the backlash never went away. Mm -hmm. um, is everyone here, or do you want me to? The, um, the, com the comment was that it seemed, as, as she was listening, she was thinking of backlash, and it feels like the backlash never went away. No, and you know, it's, um, you know, I mean, I feel like all my life I've been watching um, in women in this country make great strides only to run up against this seemingly invisible wall of resistance. Um, and uh, if I were to, you know, kind of try and make some connections between my books, um, uh, and, you know, I'm only half conscious of what those connections are, probably readers know better than I do, but um, it's that, that this book is in, in a partly um, uh, looking at the historical underpinnings of, of that backlash, because that, that wall of resistance really is this mythology of, uh, and, and this, this uh, embedded dynamic of uh, men can only be strong if American women are weak. And so every time women get you know, up ahead of steam, we run up against this mythology. Yes? So how do you think this history from the colonial days forward uh, will play out if uh, Hillary is uh, going to be commander in chief? Mm. Good question. You all heard it. So how is this going to this, uh, play out if Hillary is commander in chief? Uh, well, as you already see, um, I mean, I, you know, it's, it, she's a complicated figure, and on, early on she was, and she still is, so it's particularly with this latest um, uh, decision to uh, go along with the idea, you know, calling uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards terrorists. You, you know, you see her trying to prove that, you know, she's, She's, you know, man enough to um, to hold the office, um, but you know, more recently, she's really come out in the open and courting women's vote more directly. And um, when she was in Oakland um, a, f a few weeks ago, uh, when I was back home, she was at a rally saying, you know, if you elect me, I will put an end to cowboy diplomacy. Uh, so you know, I think she herself is still a work in progress. But, but the the idea of uh, that you know that a woman uh, can be you know is is now a front runner in on the uh, on the Democratic slate, and that she is electable, and that the media has finally sort of accepted that possibility is. Uh, I think uh, a sign, along with you know the rising national disgust at where the the uh, uh, country has gone, 
um, that that people are beginning to um, question the, uh, uh, the the sanity of, of following this mythology. Um, you know whether where that will lead is it's we you know it's hard it's hard to say at this point and it depends on a lot of things including another you know god forbid another attack will people just retreat back into their um, back into the mythology so, yes i wonder if you could talk about how much the mythology is perhaps driving policy as opposed to um, the mythology being mobilized to um, drum up support for the policy right. and how that interacts. Right. Well, it is, you know, it's, it's this inevitable chicken or egg. I mean, it's, it's going both ways. Um, I, and certainly the Bush uh, administration, or Bush's handlers anyway, um, have been very astute at massaging that imagery and, and you know, preying on people's fear um, by offering them these consoling fictions. Um, you know, and some of, some of it is, is conscious. For example, Karl Rove, um, after, in the weeks after 9-11, he made repeated trips to Hollywood and then invited movie moguls to, um, to the White House um, and it, it urged them to put together basically propaganda. I think he called it communicating. Um, you know the mission ahead, and he, with his special, you know, PowerPoint items about you know these people are evil, and um, and the re one of the results of that was uh, a film that uh, played on uh, more than a, it played on more than ten thousand um, cinemas across the country um, as a sort of short film, um, like almost, you know a trailer, um, and was uh, shown in classrooms uh, all around the nation as uh, offered as a study guide and it was basically it was called the spirit of america and it was basically a rapid fire montage of uh, of old movie heroes it was quite heavy on westerns and it began and ended with the opening and closing scene of the searchers so and I, in the book, I interviewed the uh, filmmaker who, who made it, who, whose politics are actually not at all in line with the Bush administration, but he, like a lot of people, I guess, was caught up in the moment. And he said, he said to me, you know, um, in pulling together these, these clips, the thing I was thinking about was um, rescue. It's like all these films are about, you know, rescuing. And of course, what he didn't say, but what was obvious in watching the film is it's all about rescuing helpless women. Um, How far back in history do you have to go to find an equal and opposite propaganda campaign? Mm, equal and opposite. To oh. What, to the, what Rove did. Oh. In, uh -huh. yeah, I think <laughs> to the beginning of time, perhaps. <laughs> um, um, you, you mean that I've gone in the other direction? Uh, well, you know, the women's movement, uh, the peace movement, um, there have been many efforts to, to challenge um, the mythology. Um, Would one be successful with that? I, it, that remains to be seen. I mean, I think we haven't even tried, is the thing. I mean, we have yet, we have yet to even acknowledge what happened after 9-11. I mean, many uh, people, I think because we were a terrified and b, um, you know, sleepwalking and 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 c that there was such silencing of any kind of discussion or debate or dissent after the attacks um, that that whole period sort of went by in a blur, and then it was, oh, I'm, you know, we're so tired of 9/11. What we were tired of was. You know the same. You know four platitudes about everything changed and um, and everything changed and everything changed and that was and it's unimaginable and it's the end of irony and, the, and that was sort of the end of the, end of the discussion. Yeah. Well, did we have a, an opposite propaganda campaign during World War II to get women into the factories, mm. Rosie the River, and all that? So well, world. Yeah. But and then I, at the end, it was a get them all back. Right. And, yeah. Right. And I, actually, I talk. Yeah, I talk about that in the book because that was one of um, one of the anomalies that um, perplexed me was um, 
as much as in the first, you know, couple of weeks there were press accounts saying, you know, this is going to be our new day of infamy and now, you know, finally the baby boom will have its, you know, greatest generation. We're going to all respond, you know, together. Um, that quickly uh, petered out and what replaced it was really a kind of 1950s reaction. I mean, here we were supposedly in a wartime mode. Uh, yet we're talking about women going back to the home, and you know, I mean, and uh, there was a lot of talk about the return of a cold war, you know, cold warrior manhood. Um, what I came to um, in thinking about this was that um, the fifties, actually, in a, in a fight, or in the end of World War II and bleeding into the fifties, was a period um, that did in a sense, parallel our experience um, on 9-11 more than World War II. And what I mean by that is um, uh, World War II, you know, was a, it was a sort of, you know, old-fashioned, you know, clear, clear who, you know, fight against another or several other nations. Um, and as much as we were attacked on home soil, it was Pearl Harbor, which, you know, to most people seemed quite distant. Um, whereas, uh, at the end of World War II, the dropping of, of the bomb um, by us uh, and the invention of uh, the guided missile and the long-range bomber uh, left us with the sense that we were no longer this protected, you know, fortress um, uh, continent in isolation, that we could be, um, you know, penetrated and violated at any moment. And it's very interesting when you go back and read um, the press accounts right after um, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki that uh, there was all this uh, sort of hysteria here about how um, how frightened and threatened and vulnerable we were and uh, there's much press commentary about the, the quote-unquote fear psychosis in America. Um, so again, it was, I mean, likely with the Indian Wars where we put out all this violence and then there was all this sort of terror at what would ensue. Yeah. Uh, the one that struck me the most was um, uh, show your loyalty to America. Go out and spend money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that was, and, and there, speaking of distinctions between World War II and, uh, you know, I, the difference is we had this, um, uh, you know, chess beater in a borrowed flight suit telling us to max out our credit cards, you know, as opposed to World War II where we had a man in a wheelchair um, uh, giving us fireside chats and ap that appealed to our hopes instead of our fears. Um, and I, I don't, I think he was suggesting we uh, save money, right, <laughs> and, and donate it to a cause. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think it's very disturbing how much of the media of, of all kinds is in, under the control and ownership of conservative right-wingers such as Rupert Murdoch. And how is this message about insight and introspection going to really be disseminated mm -hmm. to the American people? Are you being interviewed on CNN and MSNBC and anywhere? Right. No, it's just a very good point. And it's, um, I mean, you know, as a as a journalist, or sometimes I feel like a former journalist since I don't really identify with most of the journalism today. Um, it, it, it's, it's horrifying. I mean, uh, my, you know, I, my, the last newspaper I worked for was the Wall Street Journal, and you, you know who owns that now. Um, and, you know, and, it, and it's funny because uh, one of the uh, some of the journalists who interviewed me for this book say, well, you, you know, you quote um, because uh, some, some of the media you quote is conservative media, and so that, <laughs> you know, I want to say, well, excuse me, that, that is the media yes. now, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but even aside from the conservative media, what was stunning to me was how much of this was in, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, it, you know, it was all over the place, it was, you know, uh, New York Magazine, um, Adla uh, well, Atlantic Monthly is fairly conservative, but um, The Nation, you know, there were, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say, the, the Nation was one of the offenders who um, dropped women out um, after 9-11, uh, after that uh, The Nation ran 
um, a whole issue that was devoted to uh, common, you know, various diverse commentaries on um, about what, how we should respond. It was called in the title of, on the cover was a just response, and you open it up and they did not have one um, commentary by a woman. In fact, the entire um, issue had, uh, with the one exception of Katha Pollitt, who had a regular column, and that was the column she wrote on um, maybe flag waving isn't such a great idea, which was the column that she was horribly attacked for in um, all these uh, you know, publication, uh, uh, publications called her you know, a bad mother for denying her daughter um, uh, the pleasure of, uh, of uh, waving a flag when in fact her, I mean, she didn't deny her daughter anything. Her daughter put out the flag, she didn't. Um, but uh, so it, it, it isn't. It isn't even just the, even just the conservative media. And we can't even anymore say just the conservative media since it's in, the, that's encroaching on everything. Yeah. I'm curious. I've, I've read through. I haven't read this one, but I've read your previous two books, and I'm listening to this, and it sounds like this. It's got the same melodrama. Um, you've got you, know, you, had the, you had Stiff, and, and as well, we had men's issues. Where do you see this issue ever resolving? Is this the eternal issue, or I mean, I find it interesting that even 9/11 becomes a male-female issue, mm -hmm. and validly so, it sounds like. And so, what I'm saying is, where do you see any answers? I guess you bring up a lot of questions. I guess I'm curious on conclusions, answers. Right. Well, I wish I had an easy conclusion. I mean, this what I'm talking about is so deeply ingrained in our um, way of thinking, um, and has. You know, and we've reinforced it over and over. I mean, this is a this is a, a, a mindset that has you know we've been working on since um, since we first uh, miscast poor Daniel Boone as a um, as a, a guy who relished Indian killing when he in fact um, had you know a very different story and then. Uh, Felt terrible shame about the three uh, Indians he had killed. Um, you know, the place to start is by talking about it, by confronting it, by simply acknowledging that it exists. Um, and you know, questions that involve uh, male and female roles are always you know horribly charged. I mean, you just bring that up, and it's like, oh. Um, uh, and we're very, very invested in this in this whole idea. Um, but I think one, I mean, just one, and it's a rather sentimental idea, but I'll put it out there anyway, is that we do have um, an alternative that, from our earliest history. And that is, here we have our founders who, um, you know, sadly, are mostly founding fathers, but um, no doubt influenced by women in their lives, uh, in part, um, who were steeped in this whole, uh, I mean, they were the generation that came out of the, these early Indian wars. Um, and yet they embraced uh, a, a vision of a society that um, was not go it alone militarism, that was not cowboy bluster, that was um, uh, uh, Putting forward the the principles of tolerance and liberty and um, and expanding civil liberties, not attempting to uh, uh, withdraw them as we are. Uh, so that would be that would be one place to look, and another place would be in the in the uh, very early uh, days after 9/11. There was, an, there was a possibility of going another way, and particularly in New York, where, where people reached out to each other, where people comforted each other, where there was a real ethic of, of compassion and, and sympathy, um, and, and, and yearning for this not to go, in, in, not to resolve itself in, a, in further violence, but to find a peaceful um, way of, of, of dealing with what was before us. Barbara Lee in Congress. That's right, and Barbara Lee. There are yes, but you know, Barbara Lee. We name you know we can name one person. It's, what does that say? Yeah. How do you think the hypocrisy of a senator Craig or 
Congressman Foley impacts on, on this whole myth making by the administration. Oh, jeez. <laughs> the whole gay lesbian movement mm -hmm. antithetical to the John Wayne Foxkin right. cowboy. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the whole gay and lesbian movement is antithetical to it. The women's movement. I mean, they're you know, um, the environmental movement. I mean, uh, but you know, th I mean, this is the problem. We have we have sort of individuals on, uh, and and indiv we have um, you know yearnings to to challenge the culture, and then we have this this culture that like lies over us. You know, it's just a cement blanket. And it's very hard to break through that. I mean, in the case of you know, Larry Craig, well, the the you know GOP um, you know uh, uh, smoke machine just comes in there and kind of quarantines him. And you know, I mean, they keep quarantining people who don't fit into um, their in, you know uh, straitjacket view of sexuality to the point that. I hope eventually there will be nobody left, except, <laughs> except probably George W., who um, you know is in inventive enough to have an inter interesting sexual life. <laughs> yeah. culture, like a cement blanket is over us and it's hard to make change, but mm -hmm. I guess I, I tend to feel like if we start at, our, at the grassroots level, we'll start with ourselves and really critically examine how we conclude that maybe we can make some changes. Right, so, right. And, uh, you know, it's it has happened in the past, and you look at something, like any, any of these movements that have sprung up over, I mean, who would think that, um, you know, the women's movement would come out of, of you know, following the 50s, so there, um, it's, it's up to us, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, that's why I did say sentimental. I know there's, yes. a, <laughs> there's a dark side to all that. And about <laughs> possible expansive thoughts, um, I don't know, mm -hmm. privately, about, uh, and maybe, you know, have they lived later or whatever, mm -hmm. about um, gender. Um, I'm not very happy when I think about that. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> not to mention race, for yes. example, yes. just for. And, 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 Several other rather large details. But um, I certainly appreciate enormously your attention to gender inequity in backlash. And wow, did you take it for it? Um, I was a little puzzled by a stiff, but I'm going to skip quickly over that. <laughs> which I also appreciate your attention to gender equality enormously. You know, when I talk about the the cement blanket of the culture, what I'm talking about really is a corporate, you know, uh, consumer-driven capitalist culture. It's not, um, you know, it, it used to be culture came sort of organically out of a public society um, and reflected uh, the, you know, civic ideals of that society or reflected their cu the customs. Um, but what we have now is this, you know, sort of this generator on the side, um, creating a culture really removed from our own daily experiences. It's all, it's, you know, becomes increasingly passive. 
uh, enterprise and and has a, a, a terrible, you know, disfiguring effect on on each of us in our in our um, ability to feel like agents and to feel active, and therefore to to feel that we have um, the wherewithal to to challenge the culture um, because we don't even feel it as something we own. It's something that's been imposed on us. It's, Probably time for one more question. Yes. Yes. So are are all the deeply embedded myths that uh, that uh, are, are are so influential in our national life are they all unfavorable to the kind of cultural that we would like to have, the kind of yes. society we would like to build? So is it a matter of of people figuring out how to escape myths, or are there better ones mm -hmm. that we can return to and, mm -hmm. and call upon mm -hmm. that will be just as deeply embedded and mm -hmm. potentially as powerful? Well, perhaps if we could do away with the idea of myth and, and, and um, embrace an idea of who we want to be as a society and, and what, you know, what our values really are, um, and I, I think this is what I was sort of driving at with the, with the you know, returning to the principles of the founders. I mean, there was a little inkling in there of the nation uh, yeah, we could have been, um, and a nation that, um, in its best moments, was admired by the very people who, you know, are um, now um, uh, are repelled uh, by what we've turned into. But the, you know, there was a time when. Uh, we were admired for for being uh, for embracing democratic ideas and uh, for uh, uh, not being as you know hidebound and, and narrow-minded and um, uh, and f for thinking uh, that uh, perhaps uh, there was such a thing as human. Uh, perfectibility and that human beings can change and can get better and you know what um, and we don't really as Dorothy said in the Wizard of Oz I feel like all, all everything that one needs to know you can pull from the Wizard of Oz um, you know and she says she uh, if she ever goes looking for her heart's desire she doesn't you know and she shouldn't go looking farther than her own backyard we have in our own backyard our um, our own set of principles and ideas about how we should be as a nation. We just need to uh, to get reacquainted with them. So, thank you. You've been watching journalist and author Susan Faludi speaking about her newest book, The Terror Dream, Fear and Fantasy in Post-9-11 America. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about this and other programs, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find links to resources for more information on this topic, and you'll find programs featuring speakers such as David Cole, Amira Haas, Phyllis Bennis, Noam Chomsky, Rashid Khalidi, and many others. Thanks for watching, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.